through there. Hello and welcome to the Loki Heimdall Rush Comprehensive Guide. The Loki Heimdall Rush is one of the oldest strategies in Age of Mythology, but that doesn't mean that it's a bad strategy at all. In fact, I would say that the way that people play Age of Mythology today, there are a lot of opportunities to actually catch your opponent off guard and get something really good going with this strategy here. As you can see, I've divided this guide into different chapters and you can uh, feel free to skip through it. And I also finished this guide off with a quick example game, so I hope you enjoy. Okay, so here I'm going to guide you through the easy build order that most of you can probably follow. I sent my first two villagers and the ox cart over to the giraffe or the deer, or the rhino, or whatever it is that you have in your starting location. I research hunting dogs, of course, and the next villager goes onto the giraffe as well. So I have three onto food now. And then I build a villager onto gold, follow it up with an ox card, and eventually a second villager too. The Ulfsack is building a house at home, just get it over with. You already have hunt in your starting line of sight. You can, you may as well just build this house. And immediately, yeah. the offside goes over and scouts, so he can use spy on one of the villagers. Anyways, three on food, two on gold. I'm now going to send a villager to a straggler tree. I'm not going to give him an ox cart just yet. He can just use a straggler tree. That's perfectly fine. Follow it up with a dwarf now, you want as many dwarfs out as possible. So whenever you have the 70 gold that you need to get dwarfs, you wanna build dwarfs basically. In the beginning we had to spend gold in order to get hunting dogs, so it's only now we can get the first dwarf out. And at this point it's like dwarf, villager, dwarf, villager, dwarf, villager, it goes like that. And this villager goes on to food. I can help out with my town center when I right click these animals and it uh, it helps first of all because it's a bit faster, second of all the giraffe won't run away as much if you can chunk it down in one big swoop. Anyways, you saw the villager to food and then I created the dwarf, the dwarf goes onto gold of course, now a new villager over onto food. And at this point I have two dwarfs, so I keep making villagers and I look to build a temple. We want to advance fast because we are rushing and we want to establish map dominance from the get-go. So another, another villager on to hunt here and look at my gold now. I already got my temple so next time I have gold here I want an additional dwarf. Actually let's pause it right here. You notice that this villager who had been on wood this entire time, I swapped her over to uh, a pig now. Reason for this is because I have 25 wood left now. And this is all the wood I need. Cause what else I need is an ox cart. And they cost 25 wood. So there's no reason for her to be chopping wood anymore. She can go over to the pig so that we get a nice and fast advance and so that we have food for our herser eventually from here as well. That's 80 food, so um, we're going to need a lot of food. We have to be efficient here. New villager goes on to the pig as well. And like I said, we can now afford a dwarf. I think after this one, some idle villagers here. Yeah, I just auto queue an additional dwarf here so that we end up with four dwarves in total. 
6 and 100 right here and these two are just helping out. By the way I should also, also say that this is a blue lagoon with 3 giraffes. If I didn't have 3 giraffes I would have had to move over here. But because I have these two over on pigs it's actually fine. I can still advance uh, just with these two. It's just going to be very slow and inefficient having to move these yeah. villagers from there over there or over here as you'll see later. Um, this is the easy build order so it's a bit inefficient but it's easy to follow so th that's why we're doing this right I have five on gold here obviously this is too many but these two villagers I move them over to wood now because we have the food we need to advance and I'm getting the ox cart out now also these two who were on pig they go to wood as well so that leaves us with six on food, four on wood, and four on gold. And they're all dwarfs, which is perfect for us. Obviously, we begin to auto queue hearses, since we want as many of these out as soon as possible. The Ulfsack, I sent him back, first of all, to scout, to see if there's some hunt over on this side, which there is, so I can send these over there. It's not too much of walking time, so it's pretty good. I then sent him back to build more houses. It's really good to have your houses safe at home and not exposed over here. If you're playing versus aggressive or if, if you somehow get behind and you let your opponent begin to destroy houses forward, it's really bad. So get your off stack back and start building houses over here. I have two hearses out now, almost three by the time I advance. And this is good. This is because I had three giraffes here. If I only had two, I wouldn't have three hearses here, so just something to keep in mind. Instantly, I built a barracks and I keep producing hearses. I'll just keep auto queue on hearses actually, because I want these throughout the game. They're very strong units and they are what makes Loki Loki, basically. Hersa, no sorry, my offstock just scouting a bit more, finding this hunt, which is good. The barracks I just built, I can make raiding cavalry, and I'm going to build a second longhouse too. I'll stop the game here because there's not much more to say about the build order. When this longhouse goes up, I'm going to be producing throwing axemen from here, so it's, being, it's going to be Hersa, raiding cavalry, and throwing axemen. Also, I forgot to tell you this, from my town center, I'm just auto queuing dwarves. From the moment I hit classical age, I auto queue dwarves over here. And you can produce like 10 dwarves by, be, before you have to actually do anything else. When you get those 10 dwarves, we'll talk about that later, but um, just for now, that's pretty good. Okay, so the intricate build order. You start off by, let me put off Vulak, you start off by putting your initial two builders on wood, and then you build a dwarf in the beginning. Because you build a dwarf, you cannot actually research hunting dogs from the get-go. You can build a house though, so do that. Ah, let me pause here actually already. This villager here gets out one uh, load of this tree here before she moves over to the gold mine. And um, the ox cart here stays. So the dwarf the, that you just produced goes over here and this gatherer gets 10 wood from here and then goes over to gold. I don't produce an ox cart just yet because ox carts, they don't actually work. What I did there was this guy, he just, um, he just, uh, what is it called? He, he, <laughs> he loaded off his 10 wood that he just chopped over on this ox cart and as soon as he did that, I put the ox cart over to this gold mine where these two are stationed. You notice that it fits pretty well with around the time that they finish. And I just auto queue villagers to strike the trees now. Right now I'm spamming the hunting dogs button because I want this out as soon as possible. The next villagers or gatherers that comes out are going to go on giraffes and I send one of these guys with the other guy here. Now I'm getting an ox cart too. And this guy, when he's done chopping 10 wood here, he's going to go over and food as well. Like you'll see here. 
make sure that you make good use of garrison here. So now I have four on food and I have 107 wood. You probably know why I have this, right? Because I need 80 for the temple and eventually I'm going to need an additional 25 wood for the third ox cart. Now five villagers on food and I'm producing a second dwarf here. My Ulsak, as you'll notice, I just went for some quick scouting. I wanted to find the second hunt spot. That's actually my main priority. Find your second hunt spot. And when you've done that, when you find your second hunt spot, all I want to do is just basically use my spy on a villager over here. Um, so that's what I'm doing. I'm playing with the AI here, so they would be on giraffes if, if this was a real game, but they're not. I think they're on berries over here. I have five on food here and now I send two villagers over here. It's a bit of a walk, so I can actually get away with sending two villagers and then an ox cart. I'm playing as Loki, so the ox carts are very fast. They will catch up. By the time this guy has killed a gazelle and uh, hunted 15 food, this ox cart is going to be there. I'm building the temple now too, so... I'm going to have to produce small gatherers and wait with the dwarves here. But uh, let's just look at this gatherer here. By the time, like I said, he's got 15 food, it's also about the time that this ox cart is here. Fine. Keep making gatherers over here. And now I have the gold for it. I build a third dwarf. I also put this gatherer who was on gold before. I put him over here so that now I have four and I'm going to produce a fifth gatherer to send over here now. These five who have been on giraffes this whole time, actually what I just did there was I right clicked the giraffe and then over to the wood so that, look at this now, they finish the giraffe and immediately go over there. I have to be careful that I do this manually, send the ox cut over here. So it's just something to look out for. While I was talking, I actually advanced. So I got the five villagers over onto the secondary food source over here. And already then I advanced. You have a choice to make here. Do I go for it? Because I could, if I wanted to, I could actually afford a fourth dwarf. And it actually helps you out a lot to get that fourth dwarf out. Because you can just auto queue dwarfs onto your gold mine until you have nine or ten. And you're going to need that gold for iron her jars. So usually I like to just say, okay, screw it. I'm going to get a 16 second later advance, but I'll have a fourth dwarf and it's going to help me out a lot. But if you're playing Norse War and you, have, and you know that you need to advance really quickly, you can forego the fourth dwarf like I did here and just advance with three dwarfs. So five on food, five on wood and three on gold only. Though, I, like I said, I prefer to have four. Obviously, I auto queue hearses and my Ulfsag is just doing a bit of scouting until eventually he'll go back and build houses safely in base. I have some time here with my hearses so I can go and scout a bit as well. Maybe I find a relic that's useful, who knows. I have to micro this rhino here for a bit. Like I said, I want to order Q dwarfs, so that's what I'm doing right now. Because I didn't build a fourth dwarf, at some point I'm going to have to swap or switch in between gatherers and dwarfs, and it's going to be a bit of a hassle. Immediately, I get a barracks down. And you notice, because I had five on wood here, and because it's such a clean build order, already now I can build a second barracks. And this is so strong, you're going to have a big army very very early when you're doing this build here so when you hit the classical age you immediately plug down one barracks and pretty soon after you're going to build a second barracks as soon as you can and usually it's like only 10 seconds after or something but from the first barracks you build rc from the second barracks you build throwing axemen and from the temple you continually build hearses and these three buildings are going to sustain your unit production for quite a while. 
Eventually, when you have nine or ten dwarves onto gold, you start mixing in either villagers or more dwarves onto food, and you can pluck down a third barracks too. And when you do that, it's going to be a slightly different way that you do things because you want Einherd Jars then too. So from the temple you build Einherd Jars and just like before you build RC and TA from the first two barracks and then you mix in Hersers from the third barracks as well. This is the game plan and in most games this is going to function really, really well for you. It's only four military buildings and this doesn't sound like much... Uh, to most of you maybe, but this will sustain you for the majority of the game until you hit heroic age usually, or until you get more town citizens and so on, but this is a great start, it's a great game plan I think. When you use your undermine, the way it works is from the point of impact it's going to go to the nearest building and follow a trajectory from where you clicked to the building and onwards. So, I'll show you right now. If I click right here, it's going to hit this tower, follow along this line, until ending up over here. So, if I wanted to travel um, upwards, for example, I'll place it right here. It's going to hit this tower. I'm going to go up here. And if there were more towers, it would also hit towers up here somewhere. I'll try this trick shot right now. I'm not sure it's going to work, but if I press right here, let's see where it goes. Should follow along this line somehow. Yeah, it does. And just do the last two as well. You click here, hits the tower, and hits up here now. Right? Easy enough. If you're playing on Boopli, Undermine can actually hit regular buildings too, like this barracks here. If you play on Steam, on Extended Edition, it cannot. But So this, this trick only applies to Woobly, basically. But when you use Undermine on a building, once again we'll hit it here, so it's going to follow the trajectory all the way up here. You notice that the first barracks here takes a lot of damage. It takes more than 50% HP. The second barracks almost as much, but not quite. And the tower Whenever an Undermine hits a tower, it's always going down, even if it's fully upgraded and even if it just barely scratches it at the end of the Undermine, it'll always take down towers and walls for that matter. But what I wanted to show was, if I do it the other way around from this side here, I use Undermine, I take down the tower instantly, but then because the Undermine takes a while before it reaches these barracks here, these two barracks are healthier than these two are. So when you use your undermine, make sure that you hit the regular buildings first and only hit the towers at the very end, if you have the option like you do in these examples here. Um, like I said, towers always going down, so hit the towers in the end. So in the last example here, we have what is pretty much looking like a real game base here. And say we want to use Undermine onto this tower, we want to take down this tower. How do we do this most effectively? Yes, kids, that ri that's right. <laughs> we do it like this. We hit the temple first. It's going to follow along a trajectory over here. And look how much damage the temple takes here. Once again, it's all yeah, it's more than 50% HP. And if it's a real game, you have your Hersers, you have your Einherd Jars, maybe even your Ulfsack, this temple can be taken down very easily. But in a lot of the cases, you simply want to use Undermine like I do here on an unfinished building where you use Undermine when it's around 50 to 60% HP and you're going to stop the building from going up and the opponent is going to lose a lot of vital time trying to get this building up in vain. And like you see here, the temple doesn't go up, but opponent uses a lot of time trying to get it up. So what do you do after you hit classical and have your production going? Well, you need to keep producing units constantly until you are full population. In terms of economy, you need to get some 9 or 10 dwarfs as soon as possible. And then you need to start putting gatherers or dwarves on food, depending on what you can afford. Obviously, gatherers are best for food, but sometimes you need to mix in dwarves as well, 
just to uh, just just because you only have gold basically to use on villagers your main priority is to keep map control and either keep your enemy from hunting or mining gold if your opponent is safely hunting and mining gold you will eventually lose because you depend on strangling your opponent off of these resources so you want to keep producing units and when you are full pop, especially if you have myth units in your army, you can look to dive your opponent's town center. If you don't think this is an option, you can also look to simply sit back and get heroic and try to finish your opponent off with the strong flaming weapons. But always keep in mind, you need to control either hunt or gold, otherwise your opponent will outscale you. So what are some of the elements of a map you want to look out for when deciding whether to do a Heimdall rush or not. Well, you want to scout your enemy base really early on, first of all, and then you want to use your spy, of course, and you want to check whether they have a forward gold mine. It doesn't have to be super forward, it just has to be somewhat accessible. If they do, that's a definite positive. Other than that, and maybe more important actually, you want to look out for the hunt situation. You want little hunt in your base and a lot of hunt outside of your base and what does this mean it means if you have like two giraffes or three zebras or uh, four elks in your starting base that's great because you will still have a very smooth archaic age but your opponent is going to have a hard time with uh, with such little hunt in the beginning and of course you want high hunt in the middle because you aim to get map control so the more hunt there is in the middle the more hunt there is for you to take basically because you have the map control you may as well use it right and a, a negative for you something to see as a bit of a warning is if there is a lot of annoying terrain on the map so that can be on a map like Alfheim there's a, all these huge chunky cliffs and long forests and it's just really hard to actually play around and if you're rushing you can you can spend like minutes just walking around these forests and these cliffs and it's a pain in the ass. So the you want a nice open space for a big beautiful base. That's what you want to see when you're Heimdall rushing. In terms of good or bad matchups to go for a Heimdall rush, I would highly recommend that you don't do this versus Isis and Set. Set has got free animals and a shifting sense and just a general really really good early game so you can very easily fend off your rush isis has got a monument meaning you cannot even use your undermine on her and she's just gonna want to sit back and go for a fast heroic anyways similarly i wouldn't do this versus hades and poseidon hades has got sentinel meaning if you go for any type of aggression you're going to get very very punished by those uh, those archer statues he's got and Poseidon has Lure. Lure gives the Poseidon player a lot of free, uh, free hunt that is safe underneath his town center, so it's not really a, a viable option. I will say versus Ra and Zeus, these are Egyptian and Greeks, but I do think you can actually try to go for some form of Heimdall aggression versus these gods. If you do so, I would say versus Ra, you should probably look to go for maybe a bit more of a boomy strategy with a quick second town center, or you could look to go for a fast heroic with Njord. And versus Zeus, well, you gotta play it really smart and you gotta use a very nice undermine onto his uh, military production so that he doesn't overwhelm you in the beginning. Let's go to the good matchups. All the Atlanteans basically I think are good matchups for you. Uranus, Kronos, Sky, it doesn't matter. You can rush them. And all the Norse are pretty good as well. Um, like we've already talked about, Loki does have a very clean archaic um, age and he can use the, the Heimdall rush, especially the Undermine is really devastating versus Norse. So uh, yeah, it's good to use in the Norse mirror. But enough chit chatter. Let's, uh, let's see an example of the Heimdall rush in action. I'm choosing a very uh, short game here. Actually, I think I will try to play some more Heimdall Rush games and I will try to upload them on my channel as well. Feel free to uh, comment if you like this video or um, give me suggestions on what to do in the future. For now, enjoy this game.
Já, timbur sveinn. Já, já, já. Ég vil. Já, ég vil. Let's try the Heimdall rush here. Tilbúin. Grjóðsveit. Skipan. Tilbúin. Ég vil. Tilbúin. Ég vil. Já. Skipan. Samþig. Já. Two rhinos in the beginning should make it fairly doable to Heimdall rush here. Já, hver er þar? Já. Tilbúin. Já, beiðimaður. Já, samþigmaður. Skipan, samþigt. Já, samþigt. Já, samþigt. Já, ég vil. Sa, ég vil. Samþigt. Sa, hver er beiðimaður? Hver er það? Samþigt. Oh, já, ég vil. Mine go. Thank you. Skipan, samþigmaður. Já, ég vil. Samþigt. Ég vil. Ég vil. Ég vil. Ég vil. Ég vil. Ég vil. Samþigt. I'm pretty sure if you used Shockwave, I would have lost my all sack there. By the low HP one, you probably won't expect me to do that. Something? No. Where is that? Skip on. Here we go. This mine isn't the best for Heimdall Rush, to be honest. I did promise you a rush, though, so I will. It's perfect spot right here. chicken now so I just gotta not screw up and I'll be fine but so much food man But yeah, like I said, he's a chicken, I'm hunting. All I gotta do is not screw up and I'll be fine. Já, 
Might even be able to kill him sitting here. Ah, uh, shame I didn't get to undermine the barracks there. Space elsewhere. Til No more dwarfs now, because I want to get higher success now. Something. There's my giraffes, that's good to know. Alright, I should be good to go here. GG. Yeah, like I said, all I had to do was not screw up. As soon as I even uh, just stopped him from hunting here, all I had to do was not screw up.